This is the very famous candle in a glass demonstration. Now it's a little bit different because I have a pressure gauge that's going to measure the pressure inside the container that I do that that, that candle burns in. So here I have the pressure gauge with it going through an opening to the top so it doesn't get submerged by the water. So I'm going to set this on the container here and I'm going to try to light this candle and put the flask on top of the bolt so that I have the air gauge measuring the pressure on top. Alright, so I'm going to light the candle. The candle was wet, so we're going to need more help here. All right, good. Now, candle's lit. And now all I'm going to do is try to put the flask on. Now, it would be easy if it's just a candle, but we're going after some pressure changes here. Okay, so I'm a little bit coordinated, maybe. So now I'm going to put this 5-liter Erlenmeyer flask on. And please make some observations of what's happening in the flask and, of course, with the uh, pressure readings above. Hear the gas bubbling as the air is expanding. Candle goes out and the pressure is dropping, and you see the water rising. And then eventually, the pressure is going to level out as the water stops. Now, what just happened? Well, the candle was burning, made the air inside the flask warm, the air inside the flask expanded. Because it was in a sealed container, the air escaped out. That was the bubbling. So some, there were some moles of gas leaving. Temperature increases. The pressure tried to increase, but it expanded out. So the pressure stayed pretty constant. Now, of course, the candle eventually started using up some oxygen, probably. But more so, um, the loss of the gas from the expansion of the gas, the heat through the bottom, the bubbling, lowered the number of moles in the flask. Okay? And, of course, what that did was once the candle cooled, there wasn't enough molecules left in the flask to keep the pressure inside the flask the same as the outside. So, of course, we created a lower pressure area, and higher pressure pushed on the water and pushed the water up. So, a couple of different things I want to talk about and show you today is that if you look at the pressure changes, there is a laboratory technique of collecting a gas over water, and you... One of the things you can do is that when you're trapping a gas or clipping gas over water, they always seem to ask you to try to increase, uh, try to move your, your container in a situation like this so that the water level equals this level. Now, of course, we don't have that ability here because of the um, tank being low, but I want to do a couple of different things here. I want to raise this up and see how that works. So if I raise this up a little bit, okay, in fact, what I'm going to do first is add some water. Okay, I want to add some water to the container. I want to watch you to uh, look at all right, what happens when I do that. So when I add some, some water to the container, let's look at the pressure. Let's say if I could add enough to get to the water level each equal in this line. What happens to the pressure? Watch. Pressure is rising. In fact, if I could keep adding water to that line, you guessed it, I'd probably be able to get back to my original 100.84 kilopascals that this was reading. Okay? And we'll talk about that for a second, but let's raise this up now. Let's take this to the edge. Taking this up, what happens to my pressure? It goes down. Bring it down into the water, it goes up. Why? Well, if you had the flask below the line of the water, as we do here, you have 
extra pressure pushing on the system. Right now, when I'm at the level here, it's really a manometer problem. I have the pressure pushing down, keeping the water up, and then I have the weight of the water acting against the pressure. So right now, the, the pressure inside this flask is less than the pressure of the, that's needed to support the liquid. And we can actually measure that and calculate that. But look at this. Raising it up, the pressure goes down. Bringing it down, the pressure goes up. And for those dealing with potential energy or buoyant force or anything like that, the bottom of the liquid, the bottom of the container, there's more pressure. Okay, as you go beneath the well, water, the pressure increases. So we're stacking that against us. So if we could add enough water that would go up to this line, the pressure would be equal. Why? Because we'd actually cancel out the extra pressure needed to go above the line of the surface of the water, and the extra pressure of the uh, water under the water would be the same. Now let's do something pretty cool, I think. Let's see if we can calculate the extra pressure. So right now, uh, at the line, okay, we have, let's see if we can get this nice, 99.50 I'm going to use. So 99.50. And at the bottom of my container, okay, I have a hundred, about a hundred. So 99.5 and a hundred. Two nice numbers for me to remember as I sit this up and go back to the um, uh, table. So let's just sit that there. So 99.5, 99.5, and a hundred even. So. Let me go to the big screen here. Okay, my hands are wet, so I'm not going to work. And let's go to a new file. And let's do some math here. So we have 99.5. Let me choose a nice, you can see. So 99.50 kilopascals. Okay, that was the pressure of the flask when it was right at the level and we had some water here so that was the pressure there then when we submerged it we got approximately a hundred point zero kilopascals okay and that's when the same flask okay, had water in it but now was submerged some level so what's that difference? Okay, well that's a difference of approximately 0.5 kilopascals. Nice math. So what are we trying to say here? We're trying to say here that the difference in pressure is due to this little difference in height. Okay, in fact, uh, I think the difference I'm trying to show here is um, what's that difference in height? So let's see if we can do that. Well. Uh, how much, well, really what I want to show, and I'm sorry that I did this to you, so I might have to edit. Here's what I want to show. The original reading, okay, was 100.84 kilopascals. That was the original reading of the flask with, no, with nothing in it. So we started. That was the pressure of the atmosphere. And when we took that flask and did their reaction and made a vacuum, we supported some amount of water. The pressure dropped to 99.5. Okay, why did it drop? Well, well, because we created a partial vacuum by cooling the limited number of moles of a gas. But, okay, if you look at our trough here, what's happening is gas is pushing down and supporting it. It's a manometer problem. Gas is pushing back. So the atmospheric pressure, okay, is higher than the gas by this difference of water. Let's calculate that. Okay, let's see if we can calculate that. Well, the difference between these two numbers, 99.5 and 100.4, let's put that in. Let's see the difference and see if we can calculate that difference. So 100.84 minus 99.5 and we get 1.34 kilopascals. So I got 1.34 difference. 
Now we know that the pressure inside is less than the atmospheric pressure by 1.34 kilopascals. That's important. Okay. Now let's do some more math. All right. So we got that difference. All right. Now let's change it up. So we know the difference is 1.3 kilopascals of pressure. Well, let's go find that height and see if we can actually calculate that. So what's the difference between the height of the water, okay, to the top? And see if we can calculate this, and let's see if we can proof it out. So I got my value here. I'm going to go up. And it's hard to do this as one person, but I'm going to give my best effort. Go to the top so that the, I have a good feeling here. So I'm reading... It looks about like 15 centimeters of liquid is being supported. And that's a guesstimate because I'm trying to do two things. So 15 centimeters, we'll say. 15 centimeters of what? Of water. So let's do this. 15 centimeters of water becomes 150 milliliters of water, millimeters of water. And this isn't a pressure equivalent, so what I'm going to do is convert it to mercury. And I'm going to assume my density is 1. So I'm going to divide 150 millimeters of water by 13.6 to get a millimeters of mercury equivalent. Okay, by dividing by the density of mercury, I'm finding the height of what that would be if it was mercury. So 150 divided by 13.6 gives me approximately 11 millimeters of mercury. Let's convert 11 millimeters of mercury to kilopascals. So how do we do that? Well, 11 mmHg, which is a tor, and I'm going to get rid of tor, so it's 760 mmHg for every 101.3 kilopascals. Let's see what we got. So we got 11 times 101.3 divided by 760. And what I get, it's equal to, lo and behold, nice red number, I get 1.47. 1 1.4, it's a 4, 7 kilopascals. All right, for my rough estimate, we kind of proofed out that that extra water being pushed up, okay, is representative of that pressure. Kind of cool, I think.